Uh, good afternoon, everyone who's joining us in this discussion today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Bhaskar Ayer. I co-head the market sales business and I head the debt capital markets business here at JP Morgan. I'm based out of Hong Kong. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing and having today's conversation with uh, Mahesh Kohli. Uh, Mr. Mahesh Kohli is actually the president and joint managing director of the Green Co Group. He co-founded the group in 2006 uh, at a time when renewal, renewable energy sector was still at a very nascent stage. Um, I think it was a very interesting journey uh, that, that he started off with. Today, the Green Co Group uh, is the largest renewable energy company in India, based out of India, with seven and a half gigawatts of installed capacity and with a forward plan in excess of 15 uh, gigawatt of capacity based out of 15 different states in India, they are actually a trailblazing success story. Um, so today we are joining uh, to have this conversation, to try and understand from Mr. Mahesh this journey until this point of time and what is his vision for the future, both for the sector and for Greenco as a company. So with that, let me turn it to Mr. Kohli. Um, you know, Mr. Kohli, when in hindsight, when you look at this, I think Green Co looks like a very obvious success story. Renewable energy sector at a time when the world is talking about a decarbonization. So clearly speaking, I think it was it is very obvious to everyone. But I think when you started it off in 2006, I don't think it would have looked that obvious. I think there would have been a lot of uh, challenges as you kind of built the company to what it is today. So why don't you please share with us uh, what this story really was over the last 15 odd years? Thanks, Bhaskar. Um, I think what's interesting for me uh, uh, is that uh, the events we're seeing around the globe today, uh, some of the fundamentals of that existed in 2006. And, and our uh, vision to look at renewables uh, for a market like India was largely driven by the view on energy security uh, and using national resources of the country. We believe renewables are national resources, which uh, if we can work with proven technologies, we can deliver a uh, great parity or fossil parity energy uh, to the market. And just as today, uh, you know, that's been a, a belief that, uh, you know, energy security and decarbonization are mutually trying to achieve the same outcome, uh, which is to deliver obviously fossil free energy to the market, but also, uh, delivering a uh, lot more value beyond just uh, decarbonization value uh, to the countries like India. As you know, India imports 80% of its oil and gas, and, uh, and also we import uh, <clears throat> a large quantity of coal. And so renewables with proven technologies uh, delivering uh, what we call as grid parity energy economics to the market was a core vision. Um, and today uh, we will deliver to over 20 gigawatt hours of energy to the market that's by far the largest. Uh, the seven and a half gigawatts of uh, portfolio uh, is comprised of uh, hydro of more than two gigawatts, uh, wind of close to three and a half gigawatts, and uh, solar of about two gigawatts. So it's a very well diversified portfolio involving technologies and capabilities which are well beyond uh, <clears throat> just standard renewables. It also includes uh, large hydro as well as part of that. Thank you so much, Mahesh, for that. Um, I think what's quite fascinating for me is the fact that Green Code distinguishes itself as not just having, you know, solar in its portfolio, but like you rightly point out, I think, a host of different technologies. And uh, if, I, if I understand that as you look forward, you are also looking at hydrogen and molecular technology and all of this also to make a difference. Can you kind of share a little bit of your thought process there as to how that will evolve? Absolutely, Eric. Uh, for us, uh, you know, we call ourselves Green Co 3.0 now, and we're working towards Green Co 4.0. And in this 15-year journey, uh, it was all about, you know, what is Green Co's value add to the market? And you know, the value add doesn't start and stop with decarbonization, or doesn't stop uh, with uh, the national targets. It starts with you know, what are those technologies and pathways which we can contribute, uh, which obviously has some barriers to it, but also. Uh, some unique models uh, which can deliver most competitive energy and uh, other forms of uh, <clears throat> low cost uh, clean energy to the market. Um, so along this way, as I said, we started with the idea of standalone renewables um, 
uh, and we're at 700 gigawatts of that today. Um, and we're beginning to call that standalone renewables as legacy assets now. Uh, we believe now that for uh, renewables to grow, uh, for the target uh, country has set out to deliver, uh, starting with 175 gigawatts by 23 and 450 gigawatts by 2030. Um, for that to happen, fundamentally, uh, energy storage has to be uh, critical, uh, and, and particularly long duration storage, you know, which is involves more than six hours of energy storage. So as Greenco uh, <clears throat> uh, 3.0, uh, 1.0 was about enabling this fossil parity energy economics, starting with small hydro type assets. Greenco 2.0 was about scaling up this to, to whatever seven gigawatts plus we have. And Greenco 3.0 was about solving the challenge of long duration storage to shift low cost solar and wind resources uh, from six hours a day or eight hours a day to make it around the clock 24 by seven, and also make it available at the times of demand which is largely during peak time and other, other points of uh, demand profile. And, and long duration storage is key to that transition uh, deeper. Uh, and uh, once we saw the long duration storage, we are building right now over 50 gigawatt hours of long duration storage by 2025 using what we call as closed loop pumped hydro technology, uh, which will deliver uh, storage at around $60, $65 per megawatt compared to batteries at $250 today. And it is forecasted to, to go lower, but I mean, today's challenges are making it even higher. Um, with that fundamental uh, you know, economics being solved through long duration storage, uh, now we have a unique scenario where we are delivering energy plus storage uh, and able to make renewables base load available 24 by seven cheaper than coal. And we're able to make energy plus storage uh, and make it energy flexible and deliver during only peak times cheaper than gas. Um, so that's the Greenco 3.0 shift we could transition uh, the market towards. Um, otherwise, the challenge of renewables required more coal or gas to keep balancing it. And in fact, the inverse effect started to happen where more renewables meant more coal to keep balancing it. And also the economics of coal had been uh, on upward trend uh, to balance uh, uh, renewables. So this Greenco 3.0 is that shift. And Greenco 4.0 was about how do we make, uh, once it's all the challenge of uh, renewables becoming base load, uh, we will deliver the lowest cost green hydrogen globally uh, because the, 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 the critical factor that defines uh, the economics of hydrogen is the utilization rate of the electrolyzers and ability to, to use alkaline electrolyzers. Uh, and uh, we're solving both the challenges together and as, uh, as a country today, India imports about uh, 95 million MMSCD of gas, LNG every day. Uh, and 80% of that uh, just is used to deliver hydrogen to industrial markets. It is not for heat, not for power, uh, not for its uh, energy value. It's purely to deliver hydrogen to industrial markets. And that's an amazing opportunity and much bigger transition, probably three times bigger. Um, India spends about $160 billion on energy uh, as part of GDP. Only about $30, $35 billion is spent in power markets. $130 billion is spent in energy markets, or molecule markets, what I call it. And, and, and the biggest uh, hurdle to cross there is, is transitioning the hydrogen from LNG to hydrogen from renewables. Uh, and in the Green Core model, we call it as um, Eighty-five percent of the cost of hydrogen is uh, cost of uh, energy with storage, and only a small component of that is the economics of electrolyzers. And we're able to deliver hydrogen uh, below four dollars today in the, in the in the market. Well, this is so fascinating, Mahesh. I think for um, I think most people, uh, when they think about renewable, they have a very fixed path of what it looks like. And I think this, this, this part that you shared about how this transition has really happened from Green Co. Uh, 4.0, as you call it, to 4.0, I think it's, it's, it's an incredible story. In fact, that, that brings me to another question, and you know that's getting debated quite often now, about the fact that with energy prices actually climbing up so significantly uh, globally now, uh, is this actually going to give a fillip in the short run to fossil fuel industry or is this actually good for renewables because the transition cost now is actually speaking quite favorable to renewable. And I see people arguing both sides with equal passion. Uh, 
uh, how do you look at it and what's your own thought process about how will this really evolve and how will this really play um, for renewable sector? Sure, Bhaskar, I think the only uh, positive factor for fossil fuel has been, at least for markets like India, which imports a part of its fuels, right, it has been the reliability factor. It's been about the ability to deliver um, reliable energy sources to industrial economy and, and other parts of the economy. And, and it was always argued that renewables is not a reliable source. It is, in, you know, it's in not a firm energy source. And so you need fossil always to balance it or uh, to really run mission critical industrial uh, applications. I think once we saw that, um, once we crossed that bridge, uh, and it was seen as a holy grail to say that, can you deliver in a, a, a renewables at a same reliability factor or quality uh, factor of fossil fuel, which is what we have solved for. And that's enabling a massive transition in industrial markets. Um, big part of renewable growth has been largely in the utility markets historically, the last 10, last decade. And this decade is going to be about industrial transition. Uh, we have recently signed up with two uh, major contracts with the large steel producers and aluminum producers. Uh, which never would have thought about transitioning their captive energy sources like coal and gas, which which power their industrial processes uh, with renewables involving storage, uh, because we saw the reliability index, and 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 for all of these large industrial markets, um, uh, you know the fossil prices today combined with you know the whole uncertainty of sources of it, and uh, so they have really uh, see three benefits of now renewable transition. One, starting with actually energy security for themselves, because they feel renewables is a, is a nationalized uh, way of delivering energy, it does not depend on imports and shipping and other logistic challenges. Um, there's an inflation protected energy source, renewables, uh, unlike uh, fossil. And of course, they want to, uh, that is a lasting benefit from delivering low cost commodities and industrial products, and also at the lowest carbon footprint as well. Um, so I think it's that shift. I mean, uh, and so I've seen this previously in two, three cycles. Um, fossil energy sources at a very high price, but the reliability factor of renewables was not helping transition uh, industrial markets right now. You now that problem is solved. So you will see, uh, I mean, at least India alone, about 85 gigawatts of uh, industrial energy today is held by large industries and they are willing to transition because some of these three important challenges have been already addressed. Got it. Got it. You've also recently signed the um, climate pledge to attain net zero carbon by 2040, uh, 10 years ahead of what was kind of required under the Paris Accord itself. And I think uh, does that kind of, and I think this this maybe happened about uh, 18, 24 months back to where you are now. Do you see your confidence level on those kind of goals to be pretty much on track or you're more confident now or less in terms of how things have even have evolved since then? Sure, I think uh, you know, uh, we still believe you know, 10 years is still not sufficient. We could do uh, ahead of that. And uh, so it is our, uh, we want to take leadership in demonstrating technologies and solutions uh, within how green cooperates, but also to the, to the market. Um, so we believe uh, there's been rapid evolution of technologies and models today uh, to decarbonize all uh, aspects of the, both the sector and, and, and the corporates, the scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. And there's been a constant uh, rapid evolution of technologies to enable this uh, even much ahead of 2040. Got it, got it. You know, another very interesting part of your story is very early on, you got uh, quality of sovereign sponsors like GIC and Adia kind of involved uh, with Green Co. And clearly speaking, that requires a level of vision that actually speaking about the long-term plan. So for a lot of people on today's call who are looking at this sector and people who are kind of investing in this sector, uh, when you kind of think about their own journey of investment, um, how should they be actually putting a framework together? Because, you know, the, the modeling of this sector has not been the same as some of the other sectors that have been around for a lot longer. So there is an element of uncertainty that you kind of plan for, whether it's policy or the evolution of technology itself. So what would be your guidance to people who are kind of listening in 
but how did that play out for you as you kind of engaged with some of these sovereign names uh, through your journey? Sure, Bhaskar, I think it's been uh, two legs, you know, uh, both on equity uh, and partnership with uh, <clears throat> large sovereign wealth funds uh, and also on, on, on the on the credit side, uh, we created a very good partnership on the global green bond the journey we had, and probably the largest green bond issuers uh, in the region outside China. Uh, I think the key to all of that was fundamentally demonstrating that uh, the Green Coast path and business model is largely driven from an industrial capability perspective, not so much from a financial perspective. You know, it's not been about it's not been about let's build X megawatts and let's flip the assets. Uh, let's let's about uh, looking at a financial arbitrage between the market value versus uh, the business value. Um, so it's been about <clears throat> uh, having those long term. Uh, value-added uh, business model. Uh, as I said, where we don't add value, we don't uh, spend capital and our resources on. And so it's about making those big moves long-term and industrial capabilities being built along the way. Um, and and we build, we have like a long-term asset owner, not as I said, a financial operator. And and so whether it's our sovereign wealth fund partners or equity partners or our bond uh, market uh, partners, uh, they have been, we've been very fortunate to, uh, for all of them to believe uh, in our transition, uh, as I said, energy transition, not just at a power level beyond that as well. And, and believe that the impact we're creating um, for the market. And so it's been, uh, it's been a collective vision and as opposed to, you know, we just responding with management vision. Um, so it's, it's fundamental to that, that it's, the vision is based on fundamentals of the market, not based on financial view uh, purely. And uh, and once we have that industrial view, uh, and that long-term equity partners would like to uh, find a way to uh, be in that long-term journey um, as opposed to looking for uh, exits in the in medium term. And that's been a core strength of our business. That's that's so interesting to hear um, your your perspective on that. Uh, also, one of the things that's always true for any new sector, I think policy certainty is is quite an important uh, uh, you know area as far as the growth of any industry is concerned. So when you kind of look at policy certainty in the context of this sector in India, uh, how do you see that now, and what would you want to uh, mention to people on this call? I mean, a good part of the sector uh, evolution has been largely driven by economics, I would say, uh, though India has committed uh, targets at COP26 before as well at Paris Climate Summit. Uh, but the rapid transition of renewables, you know, disrupting uh, fossil energy for the utility markets, now disrupting fossil energy for industrial markets, and also further disrupting fossil energy for the, what I call as the molecule market, uh, has been driven by economics uh, and, and a technology evolution rapidly in the last uh, five years and the policy direction though sets out those targets and, and benefits to the sector um, fundamentally the sustainability of the business model is the key uh, and uh, so what we have always focused on is you know uh, to make sure that the business model does not depend on any subsidies or any form of large policy support in the long term maybe in short term yes um, but having said that, you know, markets, large energy consuming markets like India, India's energy market today is third largest in the world. You know, India energy market today is uh, is bigger than combined UK, France and Germany together uh, and, oh, wow. you know, uh, and third largest uh, in the global uh, perspective. Um, it is, uh, you know, sustainability of that sector has, or, or the growth of the sector has been largely driven by um, you know, as I said, the policy support, but equally about uh, the large entrepreneurship India has. Uh, you know, it's unlike in other OECD markets, which I see here, that it's not just one to large companies driving this sector. Uh, it is uh, quite a few large entrepreneurial approach and ecosystem that's very mature that drives the sector. Uh, it's not just driven by one or two large corporates. No, oh, that that is that is so interesting that you kind of uh, mentioned that. Um, I didn't. I for one didn't know that India was the third largest uh, energy consumer in the world. Uh, you know, of course, in a, in a in a moment of national security, that doesn't feel very comfortable, comforting. 
but it's at the same time um, uh, quite interesting to hear. Uh, so I think, uh, Mahesh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Is there anything else that you would want to share with the audience before we sign off? I think it's. Uh, I think this this decade, uh, last decade, was about uh, transitioning economics of renewables and technology, and this uh, coming decade is about uh, the much the transition. Transition will be three times larger than what happened in the last decades uh, beyond power sector, as I mentioned to you, uh, across um, other sectors, including fertilizer and other markets as well. Sure, sure. Thank you so much, Mahesh, for taking the time to speak to us today. Uh, we wish you the very best in your journey as you kind of uh, go forward from uh, Green Co 4.0 to Green Co 5.0 and beyond. Uh, all the best and speak soon. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Pascal. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.